So here's the point. I'm going to apply it to myself. The idea being that it's universally applicable, but I'm playing poster boy. The point is, therefore, that now I have my place in the body. That God has given me a certain role. Ideally, I know what that role is, and if I don't, I ask him. And then to the extent I do know, I keep trying to obey it. I keep talking to him. I keep using 1 John 1 9. I keep learning and living on Bible. I keep talking to him about all my concerns. What was that? 2 Peter 1 5. 2 Peter or 1 Peter 1 5 and 7 or 2 Peter 5 verses 5 through 7, something like that. Casting all your cares on him is what that the verse is in the English. That's what I need to do. Then I'm, as it were, doing my job. If I'm going to call it a job. I mean, the real goal is to learn to think like he does. But meanwhile, I got this body and I got to do something with it. And there's a certain number of exigencies with the body. I've got a certain number of relationships with people. Do everything is under the Lord. We all kind of know that. But what we don't know is why that rule is there. We really don't understand why that rule is there. The rule is there so you can develop a, a, a vertical relationship to God. It's not there because, oh, you're a good boy if you do this. If you're thinking you're a good person if you do a certain thing, then you're learning the wrong lesson. That's not the lesson from God. That's the lesson from Satan. Satan wants to turn everything into merit of the individual doing whatever. Satan wants good deeds. God wants God deeds. God deeds means vertical. Good deeds is horizontal. So whatever I'm to do, that is his will that I know to do, is to be done to him. Not to the horizontal people I'm doing my job to. Now how do you do something to the Lord? The first thing we're all going to think of is, oh, I better do it right. I've got to, you know, be careful. I've got to try to do the job right. Well, okay, but that's really not the point. It's part of it. We're thinking horizontal when we emphasize that. That's not the main thing. The main thing is why. If you're doing something to somebody else, then you're looking at the other person, aren't you? If I'm talking to you, ideally, I'm thinking about you. The words I use, the way I talk, the things I'm thinking about to say to you are based on you. Not me. See the difference? If I'm praying to God then my eyes should be on God. Right? If you're eating food, then you're thinking ideally about the taste of the food you're eating. That's to the food, right? If you're watching television, then you're looking at what? The TV. And thinking about what? The program you're watching. See the difference? So if I'm going to do something to God, then I should be thinking toward Him and talking with Him about whatever it is I'm doing so that I can relate it to Him. Which is kind of hard to do because it's like whatever I do, it's not doing anything for Him. That's a problem I have when I go through the rest of my day. It's like, Dad, this isn't doing anything for you. So then I fall back on, well, what's the right thing to do? And the game is really with him. 
It's like, well, why are you choosing this? Why choose that? Why choose something else? So that it turns into a conversation with him about the principles behind what's going on. Not so much about whether I'm even getting it right. To learn about what the principles are from. In other words, turn it into Bible class. Now, once it's turned into Bible class, it becomes really meaningful to do anything and enjoyable. And an occasion of a relationship and conversation with him. Now it's vertical. And, you know, the day that I learned this, not that I'm getting the practice of it right, but the day that I learned this really changed my life. It was years ago, I was pacing the, the living room. Heard, you might have heard me talk about this before. I was saying to God while I was pacing the living room, what are you getting from my existence? What, just because I learn and live on Bible? That's nice for me, but what is it doing for you? And I was really upset because I kept thinking, there's no point to my existence. And he hits me with the thought, Matthew 4.4, 4, always occurring. Those were the exact words that hit my brain. Now you have to go look up Matthew 4.4 4 to get this. Because it's like the ultimate reason why God's designing everything. What he gets out of it by his own viewpoint. What does Matthew 4.4 4 say? That you don't live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Learning and living on Bible. Christ said that to defeat Satan. That was the first temptation that Satan made. Okay? And that's what Christ said to stop him. Because Satan was saying, Oh, you poor thing. You're so hungry. How can God be so cruel not to, you know, allow you to eat? You know? And then what he says aloud is, well, Speak these stones in the bread. Poor thing. Satan's being really polite when he says that. You can't tell that in the English. And the point that Christ is making when he replies is, Hi, if I'm supposed to fast... Because in his case, he was, in order to make himself weak so he could be tempted better. You know, hello, then I'm living on the word of God and I'll fast. Sorry. And Satan's like, whoa. And then when my pastor was covering this, the big point he made about it was that if Christ had even imagined bread, which is what Satan was trying to get him to do, then because he's really God, he, it would have just existed. So Satan was trying to like shoot past his humanity to his deity by getting his humanity to have an inf, you know, a reflex. You know, the word bread to get that the humanity to like form a picture of the word bread. And instead, Christ forms a picture of the Word itself, because He's the Word, okay? Really deft, you know, temptation to do, to get your brain, to, especially when you're hungry, to naturally imagine physical bread. And He was so inured, so enmeshed with the physic, with the, you know, the, the spiritual Word, that the first thing he imagines is the spiritual word. So that's why his reply is, you will live not only, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth. You see the play on words there? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So it's God first, word first, even before bread. Now, when I was hit with that, plus always occurring, what the Holy Spirit was stressing is God's omniscience. Because God is always seeing that moment. You know, he's one big now. So all the moments of a billion years ago are alive to him. And all the moments of a billion years from now are alive to him. And it's all one big now. So it is eternally pleasing to him. The cross is always in front of his face. 
The dividends from the cross are always in front of his face. The pain of the cross is always in front of his face. The pleasure from the cross is always in front of his face. And that's exactly what the Bible tells you. I don't know why pastors don't stress this enough. It's in Isaiah 53:11. Yireh, he will see. Yizba, he will be satisfied. Those are two of the words in Hebrew, in my badly pronounced Hebrew, of Isaiah 53, 11. While Christ is on the cross, he sees the results through his humanity. And he is satisfied while he's on the cross. While he's on it. Not afterwards. While he's on it, seeing all that at once opened him, made him big enough in his humanity because it was the only category of knowledge he did not have in his humanity was the knowledge of sin. Second Corinthians 5.21 He, Father, made him, Son, who knew no sin, comma, I'm repeating the same order as in the Greek, comma, sin. There's no comma in Greek, but it's the syntax is, demands a comma in English. Sin, that we would become the righteousness of God in him. Okay, well, in him are all of our sins on the cross, and he's seeing the results. At the same time, he's being imputed with all of our sins while they're lacerating him. Isaiah 53.5 tells you that. Okay. Mechalal means javelin stabs. So at the same time he's being stabbed, he's seeing the results and he's satisfied. And that's what Hebrews 12.2 tells you. Joy set before him is the way it's translated in English. Well, my pastor liked to translate that, exhibited happiness. Yeah, while he's on the cross, not after, while. Now, how do you and I get to that stage where we can suffer and be totally happy at the same time? Because how are we ever going to understand what it's like for God? Unless we get there too. This isn't, I mean, I can talk about this all day long, but until I actually experience it, I really don't know, do I? So the goal of God for being down here, the high and the low, joined together is to get to that place where you can have all the suffering and all the pleasure all at once like God does. Matthew 4.4 4, always occurring. Okay, but until you have enough Bible, your tolerance for the low or the high, is too small. So he keeps on, this is, you know, what Paul was talking about in Romans 7 partly, and, and more in Romans 8, is that the high and the low, you got to back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay? Your life will have a certain number and depths of, you know, low stuff in it. And certain number of high parts. The idea of God is taking you on round robin all the way down. This is what Paul is talking about. Where was that? In Ephesians 3, the height, width, depth, and breadth. Okay? He's building a house in your soul. Taking you all the way down. And you have X number of bad stuff happen to you. And it's all designed to build your soul. Meanwhile, the thing that you can know, and i got to remember this more often, is that no matter how useless it seems, or no matter how good it seems, the whole point of it is Matthew 4, 4 always occurring. So the value of your life to God is that the Bible gets in your head, and you use it, and you live on it. Well or badly doesn't matter. That it happens is the goal. God will make good on the bad parts. God will make good on the failures. You don't even have to worry about that. But is it even happening? Now, if it's not even happening, then there's nothing to make good on. You see the difference? The biggest failure of the Christian, 
The worst thing that can happen to a human is to not have Bible circulating in your soul. When you're out of fellowship with God, this is why using 1 John 1 9 is so vital. When you're out of fellowship with God, there's no Bible circulating in your soul. It might be deposited there, but it's doing nothing. So all those religious people who spout Bible all day long, but they're not using 1 John 1 9, nothing's happening there. They might as well be reciting the multiplication tables for all the good it's going to do. And they'll tell themselves that they're holy. Yeah, that's what Satan wants them to think. Do, 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 do. And you can tell that they're not, that there's no Bible really going on there because they're totally incompetent in handling it. And we're talking billions of people like this. Anybody who's a Catholic, he wouldn't know the Bible if it bit him. I'm sorry. He might get one or two doctrines right, and he might even, you know, name his sins to one of those priests. But he's not naming them to God. Occasionally, there'll be a priest who'll tell you that, well, if you can't get the confession, you name your sin to God, as if it were secondary. So how often are you going to really name your sin to God? So then if you're not naming your sin to God, then you're not forgiven. If you're not forgiven, you're not in the Spirit. If you're not in the Spirit, you're not in fellowship. If you're not in fellowship, all the Bible on the planet and in your head, even when you can recite, is doing you absolutely no good. And it is not Matthew 4 4. It's not occurring. So, all the Calvinists, all the KJVO people. And the reason why I mention them specifically is that all the denominations, every single one of them, is full of all their own prescriptions. And when you read their tenets, whether it's JW or SDA or Calvinist or Baptist, they might have like 1% right. But it's really watered down when it's right. It's really vague and confusing and fuzzy when it's right. And so much of it is just totally incompetent. The Catholics can't even count to three. They're just like the Windows 10 fanboys. No matter what you say, they will tell you, Oh, Windows 10 is perfect. It's awesome. And you're just spreading FUD. And and you're a tin, you should have a tinfoil hat. And you're a Grinch. Yeah, and the Catholics make up their excuses about why, you know, Friday is Good Friday, when the Bible never says that. They should be calling it Good Wednesday, because that's what the Bible does. But they'll make all kinds of excuses, because they can't admit that they got it wrong 2,000 years ago. Well, it wasn't even 2,000 years ago. The Catholic Church started with Constantine, not before. That I can prove historically, and already have. So they can't even admit that they got they, they got a number count wrong? Well, then they're not in the spirit. From the Pope on down, they're just all, they're going to be like, I don't know, dog peddlers in the eternal state. They're going to be at the bottom of society in the eternal state. Because it isn't Matthew 4, 4 always a crime. God's name is spoken all the time by those people. But they wouldn't know God if he bit them. So he will. It's the only way. So that means that like 99% of Christianity is going to be at the bottom. The king will be at the top. The king will be vertical. The king will have a few with whom he's in close contact. He will be far away from the many. The many will have their own life, their own societal strata. There are classes in the eternal state. And what that ends up meaning, and this is the part I hate the most, is that the relationship between the king and the kingdom goes through a whole lot of intermediaries and the king will always be far off and distant. The 
The Son of God doesn't want that, obviously, because he went to the cross. So as you get closer and closer to think like him, you won't want that either. But there is no alternative. They don't want Matthew 4.4 4 always occurring. They want some kind of lateral, horizontal life instead. So that's what they're going to get. And the vertical relationship to God will be very, like, a, you know, a finger thick. A little finger. Whereas the pipeline to God, for the person who's lived and learned on Bible, learned and lived on Bible all his life, will be, you know, like 60 feet wide. So the throughput, remember when I was talking about integrated throughput? The throughput for the king will be like, shoo. it really is that kind of difference. The integration with God vertically determines the size of the spiritual pipeline. The size of your soul is as it were the pipeline. Remember, it's a circle. Remember when I did all those diagrams? You get filled up. You weren't brown anymore. You started out empty and then you became brown, and then you believed in Christ, and you were positive, so God started to make you purple instead of brown. But for most people, they start out blank. They start out small, and that's where they say they stay, and they just turn brown, even if they're saved. So you have a little tiny pipeline, which is as thick as the smallest finger forever so the amount of spiritual information that can flow through it vertically is very very slow and very very small and basically the person's like a little child and you have to talk to them like a little child and this is A and this is B and the child goes oh wow and that's all it's ever going to be And their life is horizontal with other people because that's what they chose to be expert in. Not learning him. Whether it's a pope or somebody lighting candles on Sunday, they're all going to be at the bottom. Now, knowing that future means what do you do now and what I got to do now, again, turning this back into myself as a poster boy, and you're a poster boy too, is how do I live today to the Lord? To get that wider soul, to get it purpling. Now, what that ends up meaning is a kind of distance, just like a king would be distant. I'm isolated. I have no idea and cannot see how my learning and living on Bible, Matthew 4, 4, always occurring is having any kind of horizontal impact at all. But in the eternal state, it's the same thing. The difference is, in the eternal state, I will see, I will be satisfied. And at times down here, God will, as part of the whole lesson plan of growing your soul, he'll cause you to see your impact. He's done that a lot with me, so I kind of understand how this plays. It basically, when you, you're, you're, you're doing it because you know you're supposed to, you're trying to learn and live on Bible, and, and you get tired. You get despairing. You think, well, this can't be having any value or impact. But you decide you're going to go through it anyhow. So now you're blind in trying to live on, learn and live on Bible. I know you're saying it right, Dad. I believe you. I believe you. I believe you. And you're just sort of like one foot in front of the other. You feel like you're blinded. You feel like you can't go on. And it's just one foot in front of the other. And you... You know, on a normal basis, you're totally, like, dejected, totally dis you know, chanted and, and all the rest of it. But you, doggone it, you believe him. That's all you got to go on. It's kind of like your, it's kind of like your eyes are closed and you can't do anything, but you keep going. That's when he brings in the troops. 
What do I mean by that? Well, you might get somebody commenting to you. You might get an email. You might have a telephone conversation. All kinds of different things might happen that result in you realizing, oh, something I did or said really affected somebody. And you're supposed to interpret that little bit as indicative of a bigger hole you can't see. He'll do that. And, you know, the, the sort of like devil comes in. I'm not saying it's really him. There'll be a doubt that, oh, well, that's only one thing. It can't be indicative of the whole. But it is. Because you have to think about the timing. See, nobody knows but you how dejected you are. God knows. And the timing of him bringing something like that up and then causing you to connect the dots. Well, then he's telling you something. And it's not going to be just one little thing. That's like, that's like a lesson. Just like, you know, in the Bible you have very few words comparatively said about Abraham. Very little about Abraham do you get told. But it's pivotal. The whole Bible is based on Abraham. And yet very little is said about him. Same thing for Jacob. Same thing for Isaac. Very few words. And yet, the whole thing was based on that. So when you get a little bit of information hitting you at a key time when you're about ready to pack it in, but you just keep going anyway, one more foot in front of the other, your own Stalingrad, that's when God steps in. And when he does step in, and he gives you that little bit of information, you're supposed to understand it the same way you do scripture. There's a common thing that's said in theological circles, and it, it, when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. All scripture has to do is have one verse on a doctrine for it to be valid. There's usually more than one. In fact, there's almost always more than one. I can't think of a case where there's only one verse on a doctrine. But technically speaking, that's all that's required. Okay, so you have one thing that's brought up. Somebody says something to you, or there's an email, or something that speaks directly to your dejection. And the person saying it doesn't know that. God knows that. And God basically hires that person, and that person's speaking from their own free will, and they don't really understand the connection. But he causes you to know. And what is he saying when he causes you to know? Hi, I actually have a plan for your life. And everything you're going through that seems so useless, it isn't. And that's supposed to, like, you know, encourage you. He does that a lot. So... The basic idea is when you're doing what you're doing, when I'm doing what I'm doing, I should be thinking of, okay, Dad, how do I turn this into Bible class? What kind of Bible class lesson can I get from this? And then talk to him about that while I'm doing what I got to do. That way it gets vertically defined. And then what God is doing about that vertical Bible class for the eternal state. Well, I don't know that now, but he does. Not to mention that it's going to make the quality of whatever I'm doing better. And it's certainly going to make it a more uh, enjoyable time. Because it could be just washing the dishes. 
could be just washing the dishes and trying to listen to music. But why couldn't it be just washing the dishes and listening to music and, oh God, first, 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 what kind of Bible class can I get out of this? Because you're building my soul for eternity, right? I mean, Matthew 4.4, 4, always occurring, works both ways. It pleases him to remember, as it were, that moment that's constantly occurring in front of his face for the Bible class value it has. He already knows what that is, but you don't. Okay, but you can know. And shouldn't you get paid for having to wash the dishes? Well, what's going to be sufficient payment? There's only one thing that's really going to pay forever, and that's Bible doctrine. Peace out.